<laughs> Hi, my name is Ronald. I'm an alcoholic. And I hit the pipe a couple of times. Yeah, maybe more than a couple. But Before I forget, I'd like to thank the committee of recovery in the Rockies for having the, enough confidence in me and trust in me for asking me to come out and be the opening night speaker. I cannot share with you or let you know how much of a privilege I, I consider it to be able to speak at a meeting of Cocaine Anonymous in front of my brothers and sisters, my fellow recovering addicts. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart, what a privilege it is. Because growing up, I never would have thought that one night in September 1995, I'd be standing up in front of a group of folks in Utah. <laughs> see, they said I'm from Los Angeles. I'm from Watts, you see. And, uh, <laughs> Funny how God works, huh? And my sister-in-law, Lisa, and my wife, that when I was just before they called me up here, they looked at me and, and they said, you nervous? And you know, anybody who's ever spoken at a meeting, you know that feeling you get, that queasy feeling, and your pitch is running through your head, and you're refining it, and you're fine-tuning it, and you're thinking about that opening joke you're going to tell, and you know, you, you want people to like you so much, because like most addicts, I still suffer from those conflicting feelings of low self-esteem at times, and then that grandiosity when I think that I'm the man, you know, and, and those competing feelings that, that are going on inside. Man, I'm, man, I'm telling you, I'm terrified. <laughs> and I'm really glad that they have a chapter in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which we in Cocaine Anonymous use as our textbook for recovery, that lays it out for me so I don't have to play around with it. Because you see, I'm the kind of guy that I want you to think that my life was real exciting and interesting and some most of you guys didn't grow up with me my brother's here with me tonight so he knows I'd be lying but you know I could you know I could throw in a couple of homicides <laughs> you know a couple of prison stretches <laughs> you know cuz I'm a I look like a nerd you know I'm pretty much it's kind of a square looking guy and somebody sit, sitting in here and they looking at me and I got this you know look at this look at me no, I, you know, somebody look at me, I'm wearing this nice little double-breasted suit, and it fits, you know, it's not, my pants aren't all hanging off of me, my, my glasses don't have any tape on them, you know, uh, matching shoes. If you pass by me, you may have smelled a nice fragrance, uh, something called Cool Waters by Davidoff, you know. <laughs> You know, and you might say, you don't look like an attic. I'd like to welcome our new friend, the young man who stood up as a newcomer, and welcome you to Cocaine Anonymous. Let you know that the Fellowship of Cocaine Anonymous works, and I know that it works because I've been clean and sober since July the 14th, 1986, one day at a time. In the chapter I referred to in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous is chapter 7. It's a chapter entitled Working with Others. The chapter is entirely devoted to our 12th step of recovery. The 12th step that says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And it says in that chapter that I should share in a general way what it used to be like, what I used to be like, what happened, and what it's like today. And I know it's been real fashionable. I've, I've gone to a lot of meetings. I go to a lot of meetings all the time, and I hear people talk about, I'm not going to stay in my drug log a lot. You know, everybody know what it's like to get loaded. You know, I want to get into some recovery. Well, I understand that I need to share what I used to be like. Because that new man might be sitting out there looking at Ronald thinking, what has he had to share that I can identify with? Look at him. He looked like he got it made. What does he know about the pain and suffering that I've been going through? What can he say that I can identify with? Let me think that maybe this time it'll work for me. 
and I wish he could have seen me on July the 13th of 1986. In fact, on the morning of July the 14th, while I stood in the lobby of that recovery home called the Harbor Light Center run by the Salvation Army in downtown LA, not wearing no nice double-breasted suit, wearing a pair of gray, dusty corduroy pants that were hanging off of me. I'm thin now, but imagine me 30, 35 pounds lighter than I am now. Ugh. Cheeks sunk in, looking like a skeleton. Pants just hanging down on me. You know how the little gangbangers have that style with the sagging? Well, that wasn't the fashion in 86, and I wasn't a gangbanger, but my pants were hanging on me. And I remember I had this baseball cap on because I had stopped combing my hair. I, you may see these little waves in my hair now. You know, I have a hundred strokes. I brush it every night and put a little silk scarf on. You know, it wasn't no silk scarfs back then. My hair was so, it was kind of wavy, but I think they call it matted, you know, <laughs> back then. And I wasn't wearing cool waters. I had that smell of that, you know, that four or five day old must you got on you when you've been wearing the same clothes and you haven't taken time to bathe. And my glasses were these big black plastic, I call them county rims, they're the kind you get when you're on welfare. And they had a big white piece of adhesive tape holding them together right there in the corner where a guy pistol whipped me for not following directions. And I remember it wasn't nothing funny on the morning of July the 14th of 1986. And I couldn't look anybody in the eye. That guy was giving me those intake questions, you know, when you go to the, the recovery home and they want to know, are you really, you know, are you really an alcoholic? Do you really have a disease? And, you know, and he was asking me, how much did you drink? And I couldn't even answer the questions looking in his face. I was looking down at my dirty tennis shoe tops because I was so ashamed of the animal I had become. See, and I need to remember what it used to be like. To know those days that, I don't know if anybody can identify with this, but when I used to, in the last days of my addiction, when I would get ready to cop, and then you get, go get something, and then your stomach be churning, and before you could get it, see, and I'm a smoker, you know, so before I had to get my, my hook up, my pipe and stuff, and before I could do it, my stomach is churning, I just have to take a dump, you know, and then... <laughs> And by now, I don't have my own place, and I, you know, I'm smoking in garages and shit by now, and so now I just shit on myself. And then I go smoke before I can even clean myself up. See, and I need to remember that's the kind of guy I am when I smoke, when I use. I need to remember I'm that guy that walks the streets at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning after I got put out of the dope house for sweating people. You know, your money, you spent your money a couple of hours ago and you telling people you got money on the way and by now they, they kind of figured you were lying so they put you out. But they addicts just like you so they let you stay just in case you got money coming. <laughs> I don't know how people can say we didn't have no hope out there. <laughs> it's full of hope. You know. <laughs> and by now they put me out. And I can't go back to mama's house because she's changed the locks because I've been stealing her food out of her refrigerator, cooking plates for people around the neighborhood, and I'm just walking the streets. Got nowhere to go. Just looking. Looking down at the ground, wondering what happened to me, man. Might see something white and pick it up and put it in my mouth. And it didn't start off like that for me. I was born and raised, in, in, like I told you, in Watts with my mother and father. And I have five brothers, six of us. And we stayed in one bedroom, the six of us. And my mother and father stayed in the other bedroom. We were a real poor family. And I remember my brother Ralph and my brother Willie, they were the oldest. They had it good. They got to sleep together in the, the regular bed. And my, the other four of us had to get the bunk beds, right? You know, we had one set of bunk beds. And I remember 
I'm the third one, and Reggie's the fourth one. So me and Reggie, we had our selection. We took the top bunk of the bunk bed and slept together, and Ricky and Rod slept in the bottom bunk. You know, the top bunk was better than the bottom bunk, because if you peed in the bed, you know, it went, <laughs> kind of went down, and you could always play it off, you know. <laughs> Not me. We were a real close family. <laughs> and I remember I grew up with my first real resentment. It was against my father, because he was a drunk. He's an alcoholic. I know since I've been in the fellowship, they say we should only label ourselves. We really shouldn't call somebody else an alcoholic or an addict. But I suspect my father was an, ad, was an alcoholic because he always had these empty, empty ripple bottles laying around the house. He always smelled like cheap wine. He was always getting paid on Friday and would never come home till Sunday. And he was always broke when he came home. And I remember my mom would always be crying and stuff, asking, Ralph, how come you couldn't bring home any money? No money. We got all these boys to feed. And he mumbled some silly answer that didn't make no sense. And I remember I grew up hating him for being such a weakling, for being this drunk. And I said, I vowed I would never grow up to be like him. I would never grow up to be an alcoholic. And so I didn't drink or use anything for the first 18 years of my life. Straight square. But you see, even when I grew up, even in this family of all these brothers around me, I still felt different, somehow disconnected from what was going on around me. And you would have never thought of me and my brothers. We were tight. We all played together. We did things together. But they just don't know, man. I, full, I grew up full of resentment against Ralph and my brother Willie. They seemed to be good at sports. I was never good at sports. They seemed to be taller than me. We all look pretty much alike, but we're all short. But I seem to be the shortest out of all six of us. And, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old now. I guess I've hit the growth spurt. You know, I, I'm finished doing my growing. You know, I'm five, four and a half. And I will never, that's right, a half. I'm going to get it all. Okay, half inch. <laughs> Still saying it. I always hated being this short. I always hated being so thin. I always wanted to be like you burly guys I see in here. You know, I, was, I wanted to be buff, athletic. And I was always this little thin railed guy with this bird chest. And I always hated that about myself. I always hated being so, so dark. You know, I don't mean I hated being black. But even among black people, we had classifications, you know, and this was back in the 60s before black is beautiful. And, you know, and that, they always used to call it, you know, you black so-and-so. I used to, no, I'm brown, you know, and then the Latinos came and took that from me, you know. I couldn't even say that. Right? I always wanted to be what they call high yellow. I always hated, I don't know, this may sound silly to some of you guys, but I always had this thing about my head. I have this hook in the back of my head. You can't see it now. I got a little hair in it. But back then, we had this style of haircut called a covatus. And it's a close haircut, and you could see every contour of my head. And they used to call me long head, hook head. Headquarters was my father's nickname for me. And I hated it. <laughs> Now, all of these things sound petty, silly. You would wonder, you know, if you knew, you may say, what does this have to do with addiction? What does this have to do with staying sober? Well, these feelings that I had about myself, these feelings of self-hatred, self-loathing, these feelings of being not at ease with who I was, diseased with myself, these were the feelings that had me in prison when I grew up. They're the feelings that are described in the doctor's opinion of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, where it says that the alcoholic, the addict, suffers from feelings of being irritable, restless, and discontented. And those are the feelings I grew up with. And I had to find some way to escape from these feelings, but I couldn't drink. And I couldn't use because of the way my old man was. But I had to try to find something. And what I found when I was growing up were books. I became addicted to reading. I became an addict to books. 
I, Ralph and Reggie and I, the three of us, we would go to the library every week and we would check out, I think the maximum books were either seven or ten books apiece. We'd check them out. We'd have two weeks to read. We'd read each other's books. We'd read all the books. Because you see, when I read, it seemed as if I were transported away from Watts. And all of a sudden, I was in foreign lands. I was in Europe. I was in Paris. I was a spy. I knew karate. <laughs> I was somebody saving the world. I, I loved espionage and I loved being the guy that was always undercover, somebody who knew these secret things. And I always loved that excitement because it made me feel like I was a part of something really big and important. I later progressed from novels to comic books. You see what I'm saying? Progression. Because you see, that was a quicker fix. It was a longer thing to read a whole novel, but you could get a comic book and all of a sudden, in about 30 or 40 pages, I was in it immediately. And maybe you remember those DC comics back in the 60s? Superman, Batman, The Flash, The Green Lantern, Justice League of America. I know somebody in here remember that. The Legion of Superheroes. I was the hero named Monel. He may not have looked black in the book, but he was. And I would tie, I would tie a towel around my neck and fly <laughs> around my neighborhood. <laughs> now I don't know if you know anything about Watts, but you know, <laughs> back in the '60s, with a towel around your neck, you know, it wasn't real cool. <laughs> but you see, I'm an addict, and that stuff made me feel strong. It made me feel heroic. It made me feel important. Later in the 60s, television gained popularity. We were a poor family, so it took us a while before we got one. We used to go to neighbors' houses, but eventually we got our own television, our little black and white, and I became addicted to television. And I would sit under the television, and they had a nickname for me. They called me the Human TV Guide because I memorized every show that was on television every day of the week. They could, neighbors would come by the house and my brothers would play a game. They said, watch this. Ronnie, Wednesday, 8 o'clock, uh, Channel 2, Petticoat Junction, Channel uh, 4, uh, The Andy Griffith Show, Channel 5. And I could name what was on every channel every night of the week by heart, from memory, a real addict. And I didn't know. I'm serious. I am not, I'm not kidding you. Because you see, this was my fix back then. And there was one television show I became addicted to that was popular in the 60s, and I idolized this guy. And when I share about him at a lot of CA meetings, some of the people who are younger in the crowd, they, they wonder why would I idolize this particular person because he didn't, he had television movies that were coming out lately, and he doesn't look very dashing or very heroic or very active. And maybe you remember him. His name is Perry Mason, right? And Perry Mason, you know, he's, you see Raymond Burr now in the TV movies. He recently died, and, and uh, he had this white beard and a cane. You know, he walked around. He's real burly and stuff. And they said, well, why would you idolize this guy? Raymond Burr in the 60s didn't look anything like that. In the old Perry Mason series, that little black and white television, I look at Perry, man, he had to be the handsomest white boy I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> Suits fitting, real nice. You know, nice blacks. Well, I guess they were black with black and white television. So, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> Jet black hair, just slick back kind of, you know, walking around, had this presence about him in the courtroom, walking around, examining witnesses, just in control. And there was something about his eyes. Raymond Burr had these piercing eyes, and he had a glare, a stare. He could fix a witness on the witness stand. And they get near the end of the episode, right near the climax, and you knew whoever he had on the stand at the end, that's the person that did it, right? Because you knew what was coming up. And he'd have him and he'd say, isn't it true? Did you ask it? Is? <laughs> or somebody would run from the back of the courtroom, I did it, I did it. 
I mean, I don't believe I ever even saw a case go to the jury, right? <laughs> I know a couple of you guys in here wish that were true. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. You see, Perry was everything. He was more than just a lawyer. He seemed to be a forensic scientist, a detective, a policeman. He would not only get his client off, he would solve the crime. And that's, I wanted to be like Perry Mason. I wanted to have people looking at me at the end of the episode saying, thank you. Perry had what I didn't have. He had power, lack of power was my dilemma, and I needed power. So I grew up wanting to be a lawyer. I wanted to be Perry Mason. As I grew up, my addiction to reading played perfectly with school because I was a good reader. I was somebody who was real good at essays because I had an active imagination. And so I could always be real, you know, I was the guy you guys knew as the teacher's pet. You know, you had your names for me, the professor, Mr. Peabody, you guys knew me. I was always the guy with, you know, papers and books and glasses. You know, I was one of the original nerds, right? But I had straight A's in school. I, was, I came through um, the inner city in Los Angeles, uh, 109th Street Elementary School, and, and some hardcore areas in Gompers Junior High School and Lock High School, and I was getting these A's, and I was becoming more active in student government, and you would think that I would have been real happy with these accomplishments. But on the inside, even on the outside, while I tried to portray this attitude of better than because I'm this, you know, I'm this guy, on the inside, I always felt like I wanted to be like the athletes, those guys who were scoring the touchdowns, who were getting the write-ups in the newspapers, the the cool guys, the ones who could go to the dances and they could slow drag with the prettiest girls or they would be the king of the prom or, or even those guys that you wouldn't think that I would admire. But there were always a group of you guys. I see a few of you in the room tonight. I'm not going to point you guys out, Jim. But uh, <laughs> never went to class, right? <laughs> always kind of hanging by the hash lines. That's where you get your food. Just kick back, hands in their pockets, smoking cigarettes, sometimes smoking reefer. Just cool. I'd walk by them and I'd smell that weed and I'd crinkle up my nose. That's nasty, right? <laughs> Little was I know, right? <laughs> but at the time, they'd stand there and they just seemed so cool, so in control, so self-possessed. And occasionally a girl would walk by and they would do a very vulgar act. They would kind of grab their crotch, right? Just to show that they knew they had it down there. <laughs> and I'd walk by and I'd say, disgusting. You won't even graduate, right? <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was my comeback, right? <laughs> but at the time, even when I portrayed that, what I felt inside was damn. Look at that. These guys, 16, 17 years old, just like me. But they seem so confident. They seem to know what life is all about already. They even have enough courage to grab their stuff in public. I could never do that. So on the outside, I tried to act better than, but on the inside, I felt less than. That's the story of my life. That's the story of the way I grew up. When I got out of high school, when I graduated from Lock High School, I was accepted on a scholarship to go to college. This university in Los Angeles called Loyola Marymount University. Now this is a small Jesuit Catholic school um, in Westchester, LA, and I'm coming from the inner city from a Baptist background. I don't know anything about Catholicism. I don't know anything about what it's like to go to college or whatever, but I'm excited and I'm scared. My senior class gave a beach party the summer after I graduated, before I started college. And at this summer beach party, it was one of those night beach parties where they're burning fires. They got fires going on the beach. And I'm walking along by myself drinking my soda, right? 
and I see this guy and this girl underneath this blanket. And the blanket was moving. <laughs> and I heard the girl giggling. <laughs> and I said, damn, I want to get underneath a blanket. But, but everybody knows the professor doesn't get underneath blankets, right? And somebody was passing around something, and I wish I remember what it was because it became my first drink. It was high-class stuff, you know, something. It was either some Tyrolia or some Spinata. <laughs> now, you know, we were high rollers, I guess, back then. And it was back when they made it in the jugs, you know, the kind that you hook your thumb through and you throw over your shoulder, you chug a lug, right? Because, you see... I wanted to get underneath a blanket, and I felt like if I drank something, I would have the courage to do that. Because everybody else seemed to be able to do that. And by now, I had forgotten that vow I made while growing up about never drinking, about never becoming like my dad. Because you see, I figured he was nothing but a janitor. I'm going on a scholarship to college. I'm ten times as smart as he was. He was just ignorant. He wasn't as strong as I am. He wasn't as intelligent as I am. I'll be able to drink and control it. I don't know if I consciously at the time thought all that, but I knew I was different than him. I was better than him. And my head told me, I'll just have a drink and get underneath a blanket and everything will be all right. I never thought that I would become like him. And I didn't right away. Probably only another alcoholic or addict will understand what happened to me in the beginning when I drank and used. When I would drink, I never really liked the taste, but I acquired a taste because, you know, I knew what was going to happen. But that burning sensation would go down and I'd scrunch up and it would go down in here and it would be hot, you know, and it would start to spread down in my gut. And as it spread, I just got tall. And I just got buffed. Maybe you saw the Hulk series. It seems like stuff, I just got pecs, you know. Stuff just started to pop out on me. <laughs> and my hair just got long. And my skin just got light. And I just got cool. You see? Right. Before, when I would try to curse, I would say, oh, Oh, you motherfucker. <laughs> the professor, right? <laughs> Let me drink something. Yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> you know, with the head. You know, yeah. Little subtle changes took place in there. Now, when I would go to the dancers, I was no longer the wallflower who would stand at the back and watch and see, you know, who was the ugliest girl and so, you know, maybe she won't say no to me or I would look for another nerd and I would look at who he would ask to dance and if she danced with him, then I'd ask her to dance too. That was the kind of stuff I did. But now, after drinking, man, I was the life of the party and I was, you know, I was dancing. This was back in the 70s when, no, yeah, 70s when the bump was out and I was... You know, I was, hey, I was partying. <laughs> I can identify with Bill Wilson and Bill's story, one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous in chapter one, where he writes in there, when, when he started to drink, he felt a part of life at last. I felt like when I started to drink, I was no longer on the sidelines looking. I was participating. I was in the game. I was playing. And I became a part of this secret fraternity, this kind of this society of guys and girls who drank. And we knew each other. We would see each other at parties, and we'd know, and we'd just kind of give each other the eye. And we'd know, you know, you'd be slipping out of the party smoking herb, right? We knew each other. It progressed so that we'd be at parties and all of a sudden we were in the get high room in the back. A couple of you guys know what I'm talking about. You know, 
this, I felt like I was a part of something special. And my way of living became a normal way of life. I began, and it didn't start off just that way at the beginning. I was still a good student. I was a freshman and sophomore, A and B student around my junior year as I started to add more drugs to my drinking and my drinking progressed from just beer and wine, the hard stuff. I started to smoke more herb. I smoked dust. This was back before it was that sherm, that water. You remember the old days back when they put it on the little mint leaves and stuff and you would keep it in the freezer to keep it good. And I was high for five days once. That's the only drug I quit on my own. <laughs> And I started using mollies, those are black beauties, and mushrooms, and experimenting with acid. You see, I'm a garbage can dope thing. I started off drinking, and the drinking eventually wasn't enough for me. So I always searched to add more to try to fill this bottomless hole. And I didn't realize I had a problem. And around my junior and senior year, I started having little things happen to me. I stopped getting all A's and B's and I started getting B's and C's. And I didn't connect it with the fact that I was going to these all night parties and that I was smoking herb and that I was drinking and that I was starting to miss exams and that all of a sudden the professor was starting to plagiarize his papers. Things I never thought that I would do before. Paying for term papers. I know you guys never did nothing like that. But, you know, I used to have this term paper service I would go to to pay for my term papers and stuff. And I would eventually, my whole character and my demeanor started to change. And I started to become a different person. And I didn't even realize it at the time. Because, you see, I was still passing my classes. And I still told myself, you still all right, Ronald. You still from the, you know, you still from the hood and you still in this college. You haven't gotten kicked out yet. Somehow I got out of Loyola on time and graduated from college. The summer in between college and I forgot to tell you I got accepted to law school pursuing Perry Mason. This school called Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco. In the summer between college and law school, I discovered this white stuff we call cocaine. Now, before I had been exposed to cocaine, but when it was offered to me, I, I always said, no, that's the hard stuff. I'm, I'm not going to do that. that. That and heroin, I know that stuff is addicting, and I'm not going to use that. <laughs> Pass me that dust joint. Right? <laughs> right? <You know. laughs> but the progression of my disease told me, and I saw what was happening around me, it told me it'd be all right to toot a couple of lines. And probably you addicts can identify with the feeling I got from cocaine when I first started using. That ultimate sense of power, of utter confidence, of just knowing, knowing, knowing that deep down where I live that I had arrived, that I was the man, that I had the plan, that I knew all the answers, that I had found the magic drug, the one that is odorless, that people can't tell when you high, I used to think, right? <laughs> you know, this, and, and I'd take a couple of one-and-ones, and I'd have me a little pack, and I think I used to be able to put it away, save some for the next day. We had Coke etiquette. My brothers and I, we always got high together. We'd always, you know, when in the beginning, when you would pass the mirror around, oh, no, it's your turn. You know, you could leave the room with your little pile there, and it'd still be there when you came back. You know, in the beginning. <laughs> and I really thought I was into the ritual of the whole thing, the whole setup, the copping, the whole, th you know, that whole lifestyle I became addicted to because it made me feel important. I felt like I was in the fast lane because, y'all, deep down inside, I still felt like that guy back in, in high school, that nerd, the guy who was the square. And I figured someday somebody's going to find me out, but not yet, because I was, I was partying. As I went through law school, I became clerking. I was a law clerk for a guy who was an addict, an alcoholic. And he would have me run out every day at 5 o'clock sharp when we finished work. I'd run out and get a fifth of brandy. We'd sit down, 
and unwind, and then he'd send me out the copper package. And we got high every day after work. And law school was perfect for a dope fiend like me because they only have one exam for the whole year at the end. So I would go for the first month or two, learn the ropes, learn what I needed to do, and I'm a good crammer. And so I would just not go to class anymore. And Hastings is one of the largest law schools in the country, and you could go, not go to class and nobody would miss you, I thought. And I was passing my classes. And I went to summer school after my first year and summer school after my second year. And I graduated early. I got an accelerated degree. I graduated from law school in two and a half years at the age of 23. I stayed in San Francisco because I wanted to graduate with my classmates who were finishing that last semester. And while I was waiting up there, I said, well, I might as well just you know, study to take the bar exam in February of 19, 1979, I believe that was. And while I was studying for that bar exam, and when I took it, the results came out the same day that I graduated. And my whole family had flown up to San Francisco and I was getting dressed for my graduating, graduation ceremony and one of my friends came by and told me I had passed the bar. And so at age 24, I became one of the youngest black attorneys licensed to practice law in the state of California. And I was on top of the world. And the champagne flowed that night. And we snorted everything. <laughs> this, was, this was before basin, right? This is before smoking. And I mean, I was on top of the world. But I'd like to tell you that this young boy wonder, this young genius, this attorney at age 24, five and a half years later when I was age 30, the only job I had was carrying out the trash for a 21-year-old dope dealer who lived across the street from my mother's house. And every Tuesday night, I believe it was, I would carry his trash out for him because it was trash day the next day. No, it was Wednesday night I carried his trash. Tuesday night I sat on his porch and I watered his lawn for him. And then I would knock on his door and I would ask him, Don, do you need anything from the store? So that he would give me my nickel piece for working for him. This was just six years after having passed the bar exam the first time around. This was young Perry Mason. Oh, wait a minute. I had another job. That wasn't my only job. I was the doorman at Mama's house. Not my mama, but this 68-year-old lady who sold dope out of her house. And if you don't know who the doorman is, he's the guy that sits next to the door. And when people come to cop, I would peek out the door, you know, the little peephole, and I would announce to Mama who it was. And she would tell me if I could open the door or not. And then I would sit back down. And then every half hour or so, somebody might pass me a hit. See, I heard some, uh, some nods of applause and stuff when I said I passed the bar at first. What happened? You see, I'm an addict. Cocaine is no respecter of intellect. It doesn't care if you graduated from law school or if you dropped out from high school. Cocaine doesn't care if you grew up in Westwood or in Watts. Cocaine doesn't care if you're a man or if you're a woman. Cocaine doesn't care if you're short or if you're tall. Doesn't care if you're skinny or if you're buffed. Cocaine doesn't care about any of that stuff. It's an equal opportunity ass kicker. <laughs> you see, if you suffer from the disease that I suffer from that is physical, mental, and spiritual in nature, It doesn't matter. I wish I could tell you in the short period of time some of the things that I did during that six year time period, but you know a lot of it is a blur and it comes back to me in snatches. Getting pistol whooped by this guy, this dope dealer, because I wouldn't watch the street for him when people were coming to cop and I had to be a lookout, a lawyer, and I'm his lookout. 
about going in my mother's refrigerator and stealing her food while she was at work so that I could cook up little breakfast plates for people that would go to the dope houses and stuff and I'd wrap the plates up and go around and hopefully somebody would give me a hit when I bring them a plate. The guy that even while I was a lawyer I would go back to work after getting paid on a Friday a nice salary and I'd go back to work on Monday begging the secretaries for cigarette money. That's the kind of dope fiend I am. The kind of dope fiend that would catch the bus to work while I was practicing law because I could never save up enough money to buy a car even during my entire practice. The kind of dope fiend that never had a nice condominium or a house or even couldn't even keep an apartment. I was sleeping on my mama's floor because she was the only person that would take me back. You see, that's the kind of disease I suffer from. Until finally on July the 13th of 1986, something happened to me in front of my mother. And she was my last enabler. And on this particular day, I burned this guy who lived a couple of doors down on a dope deal. He had given me a couple of dime bags of herb to sell for him. And I had spent his money on, on some cocaine. And I had smoked it up like we always do. And when he wondered where his money was and I didn't have it, I thought I'd tell him about this in front of my mother's house because I thought she's at home, he won't do anything to me because everybody respects her. And he asked me to step outside of my mother's house and we get this thing straight. And when we stepped outside, he knocked me to the ground with all his might and started trying to kick me and stomp me to death. And as he was kicking me and applying the boots to my head, it seemed as if I were removed from my body, looking at this happen. And while I saw him trying to beat me and stomp me to death, I looked over and I saw my mother step outside the house. And I expected her to say, no, no, stop, that's my baby. But she said nothing. This the woman who had continually sent me those care packages to when I was in law school, when I would spend all my money on dope and I would cry with those lies to her and she would send me her last dimes after she ended up raising me and my brothers by herself after she put that drunk of a father out. And this woman who I love dearly, who I didn't have enough strength because of my disease, I burned her badly. And she continued to take me back in. This woman who I thought would rescue me said nothing while this guy kicked me and stomped me. And I looked down and he was still kicking me and stomping me. And I looked back at her and she turned around and she walked back inside the house. And she closed the door. And it was at that moment, deep down in my soul, that I admitted to my innermost self that I was powerless over cocaine. It was the next day that I checked into the Harbor Light Center. See, you see, I try to make it sound fancy. I'm a real addict. I didn't check into the Harbor Light Center. I didn't have reservations. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go there with luggage, you know. <laughs> there were no invitations. I was dropped off at the Harbor Light Center by my oldest brother, Willie. And I told you the condition I arrived there in. And I was much more dead than alive. And I wasn't even thinking about staying sober. <clears throat> I was just tired, y'all. Tired of getting my ass whooped. Tired of waking up every day having to chase that rock. Wondering how I was going to get it this time. Because, you see, I had tried to get sober twice in 1985 by going to recovery home relapsing twice, thinking that I wasn't, I couldn't get this thing. Relapsing because number one, the first time I went on one of those passes that they give us, those 30 day passes, and when I went home, I wanted to carry the message. You know, I'm real intellectual. I'm gonna carry the message at 30 days, right? Now I'm sponsoring people in the recovery center and I'm, you know, <laughs> I've read the big book like a novel and I just know it, right? to the girl was smoking and I wanted to show her this nice recovery home booty I had and stuff and you know how we start eating again and we start growing out and she was smoking and she said well Ronald you haven't had one in a long time why don't you have one and I told her no thank you I'm not getting loaded anymore she looked at me in amazement 
I was real proud of myself. So she continued to smoke and I continued to look. 20 minutes later, she said, are you sure you won't have one? And my head made that shift that it's described as a strange mental quirk. <laughs> and it told me, this bitch never used to offer you nothing free. <laughs> you can have one. You see, I didn't understand the physical nature of the illness I have. I didn't know that one starts this intolerable craving, this phenomenon, this thing we can't explain why it happens, but my experience tells me that it does happen. It explains to me why I was never able to just smoke a dime or a quarter. It explains to me why I was always the one that couldn't go home, why I always had to stay there till everything was gone on the mirror, on the plate, and even then we had to rinse the pipe, and even then I'm, hold, I'm smoking over a stove, and even... Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> nah. <laughs> the second time I relapsed, it was thinking I could just drink a Michelob. Because I didn't think I was an alcoholic. If you were a smoker like me in the last days, all I concentrated on was the pipe. And so I had forgotten those early experiences with drinking. And I thought, drinking ain't my problem. And so I had one of those Michelobes, and nothing happened. So I said, shit, I'll have another. <laughs> and after I had another one, that worked so well, I said, shit, I can smoke a joint. I never had any problem with weed, and I smoked a joint. And that joint led to a lace joint, a joint with some cocaine in it. And then my head told me, why are you, excuse my language, why are you fucking around? Let's just go get that pipe. I understand that one of anything in my system sets off this craving. My experience shows me that. Not, not nothing somebody else had to tell me. My experience shows me I have the allergy. So that when I got to the recovery home this time, and I went through their detox section, and then they started bringing me to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and then letting us go to outside meetings of Cocaine Anonymous, I started sitting down and listening like only a dying person could hear. Because you see, I was scared. Because I didn't want to go back out there. Because I knew what was out there waiting on me. When I started coming to these meetings, people started sharing with me their experience, strength, and hope. And they started sharing with me from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and about the 12 steps of recovery. And they told me that after admitting to my innermost self that I was powerless, I had to come and come to. And I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. There's a chapter in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous that is oftentimes overlooked because in a lot of the meetings, they'll read from chapter three and chapter five, and they don't say anything about chapter four. So a lot of people think, well, maybe that chapter's not about much. That chapter talks about step two which is the, sol the solution to my problem. The chapter is called We Agnostics, and it talks about having a willingness to believe or believing that a power that is greater than any human being, greater than my mama, greater than the preacher, greater than a judge, greater than a police officer, greater than any po force or power that had tried to get me to stop before and hadn't been able to, he said I had to come to believe that that power could restore me to sanity, the kind of sanity that would enable me to not have those strange mental twists that would let me know the truth from the lie, that would let me not think that this time it was going to be different. And you see, there's a line in chapter four in We Agnostics that I like to share with people that touches me. And it says that deep inside every man, woman, and child, is the fundamental idea of God, that he has sometimes been obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but he can be found inside if you search fearlessly within. And I found out that the only thing I needed to do to find the power was to search inside myself, that for years I have piled so much resentment 
so much fear, so much anger on top of this power that I had hidden it and I had become lost. How do you find the power? You make a decision, Ronald, to turn your will and your life, step three, my thoughts and my actions, over to the care of this power. And I got down on my knees with some people from this fellowship and we put our hands together and I asked this power to take all of me, the good and the bad, to do with me as he would, to let me be his servant, to carry his message. And something happened just from that simple prayer, from making that decision, I felt something happen to me inside. But the book tells me, the big book tells me that that thought must be followed immediately by action. Because you see, we dope fiends, we can talk real good. But you see, I'd always had a lot of good game, a lot of good talk. And I always went back. I always relapsed. And the action is found in steps four through nine. I had to do an inventory. I had to write down these things I never wanted to look at. Those things about having that hook head about that drunk of a father, about all the things I shared about earlier. I didn't know that shit when I got here. I discovered that stuff through inventory, and I shared it with another human being and with God in step five, and when that happened, I got closer to the power. And I found out some things about myself. We call them defects of character. I'm lazy. I'm lustful. I have many shortcomings that I need to work on. And I got down on my knees again, just like I did in step three when I got to step seven. And I asked God to remove these things from me because I don't have the power to change that. But I have to participate by doing the opposite of what I had been doing before. And when I did that, I got closer. And they said that the alcoholic in the attic is like a tornado going through other people's lives. So I got to step eight, and I learned that I had to make amends to everybody I had harmed. And amends ain't no apology. That's not just saying, I'm sorry. And they say, oh, but well, it's good enough that you're sober now, and I take that and run with it, because, you know, I like to take the easy way out. You guys told me I had to go farther than that. That when I sat down with my mother at that kitchen table, and I told her, and we held hands, and we cried, and I shared about those painful things that I had done about stealing her food and about stealing that retirement watch that they had given her at the job and about all those things I felt so much guilt and shame about. When I shared that with her, and I told her, Mama, I'm sorry, and I know there's no way I can repay you, but if I could just pay you $100 a month, that's what I can do right now, and I need to do that for at least the next two or three years. And she said, Ronnie, no, it's good enough that you're sober. <laughs> and I told her, no, mom. I said, I'm trying to get closer to God. And in order for me to do this, I have to pay you this money. So she said, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and when I did that, something happened to me. I grew closer to the power. In step 10, I continued to take daily inventory, making sure that I didn't continue to pile up shit on top of the power I was now trying to gain this relationship with. And in step 11, I learned how to pray and how to meditate properly, how to pray not for stuff for myself, but how I could be helpful to other people. And in that way, I would stay out the way so that God could shower me with the blessings he intended for me. And I learned in meditation how to be quiet, how to not always be searching around for the answers in other people that were already inside me. Because we all have that voice inside of us to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And oftentimes I just want to ignore it, but if I get peaceful and quiet, and if I've done the work in the other steps, I know intuitively know the answer. Until having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, I'm trying to carry this message to addicts. 
and to practice these principles in all my affairs. After I was in the Harbor Light Center for 130 days, they sent me to their second phase recovery program called Harmony Hall, a kind of sober living. And I stayed there for the next six months. And they began to reorient me with the outside world, letting me go out on odd jobs and stuff. People from construction sites would come in, hire a bunch of the guys from the sober living to do jobs. But the first job I had was working for this little old lady who ran a nursing home. And she had me come in and be her bookkeeper and had me come in and write out her checks to pay all her bills, balance her books, and mail out the checks. And she paid me $40 a week to do that. And man, when she did that, when I rode that bus back to that sober living, man, I felt 10 feet tall because somebody actually trusted me again. Somebody actually believed in me again. Somebody believed that I could do what I said I was going to do and back it up. That's God. That ain't me. Later, I started going out. After I got out of that sober living, I started going to temporary agencies trying to get sent out on odd jobs. I forgot to share with you guys that I didn't think I was going to ever be able to practice law again. I thought I had been disbarred because... For the last five years I was practicing, I didn't pay any bar dues. You know, I'd get a couple, two or three hundred dollars, and why did I need to pay dues? I knew I was a lawyer. You know, I would, you know, why, sure. That, you know where that money went. Insanity. So I thought I, I would never be able to practice law again. I just wanted to become a law clerk or a paralegal or something like that that didn't require a license. The first temporary agency I went to, they told me I failed the test. You know that basic spelling and grammar test they give you when you go to a temp agency? Law school graduate, and I failed the test, and I came crying back to a noon meeting, and somebody shared, well, did you study for the test, Ronald? No. Well, why don't you quit whining and study? Tough love. I studied, and I went back, and they, I passed the test the next time, and they placed me with a temporary agency being a legal proofreader. And after doing that for about a year, somebody in the fellowship says, Ronald, you keep on going around sharing about this God you trust and believe in. Why don't you trust him and check with the state bar and find out the status of your license? Not really trusting, living in fear. I called the state bar and they told me, well, Mr. White, you haven't been disbarred, but your license has been suspended for non-payment of dues. If you pay all your back dues and your current dues, $2,500, then you can get your job back. Well, shoot, $2,500 sounded like $25,000 at the time, right? You know how you're making that minimum wage working for those agencies. Well, it's amazing how much money you can save when you're not drinking and using. <laughs> Six months later, I sent in a check to the state bar, and they gave me my license back. Two months later, somebody said, Ronald, isn't it time for you to be looking for a job? Still living in fear. Worried about the resume that I would have to make up. You know, some of you guys know what it's like to be unemployed and in a recovery home, and you got a, a resume you're writing up, and you're wondering, how can I put Harbor Light Center on the resume and make it sound good <laughs> going to work for a law firm? Somebody said, Ronald, why don't you just list the jobs that you've worked at, Okay. And then you'll see exactly where you will be with that and trust in the power. The first job I went to apply for was with this office called the L.A. County Public Defender's Office. When I went to apply for the Public Defender's Office, they had these five attorneys sitting around interviewing me. And they were asking me all these hypothetical questions. Well, what would you do if your client told you he was guilty? Uh, what would you do if you knew somebody on the jury? Or what would you? And I'm answering all these questions, and I'm thinking I'm getting through the interview pretty good, and we're getting near the end, and nobody's asked me about my resume. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to get through it. And this one guy at the end, <laughs> well, Mr. White, we've been looking at your resume, and we know you're working as a legal proofreader now. Why aren't you practicing law? I said, sir, I'm an alcoholic. I didn't tell them about that freebasing, you know. I didn't, <laughs> didn't think they really quite understand that, so I had enough honesty with that. So I said, sir, I'm an alcoholic. 
I've been sober for a little bit over two years now. Somebody asked me, well, Mr. White, this is a pretty stressful job. Don't you think the stresses of this kind of position might make you want to go out and have a drink? You know how lawyers are. I said, sir, it was stressful when I was out there. I said, I think God has prepared me to do this job. And they looked at me funny. They don't hear the G word in job interviews a lot. <laughs> yeah. God, who's that? It's like, <laughs> They said, okay, Mr. White, we'll let you know your results, your scores in about 10 days. You know, we, we don't know if we can hire you or if you're going to be on our waiting list, but we'll send you a letter. That was a Wednesday afternoon in August of 1988. I'll never forget it. I got home at about 12 noon, and three hours later, about 3 o'clock, I got a call from the public defender's office saying they needed for me to come in for another interview two days later on a Friday. I said, damn, it's probably that alcohol thing. They probably want me to pee in a bottle or something. You know? <laughs> well, when I went to the public defender's office, they escorted me to the top of the criminal courts building where the public defender's office is located. And I saw this guy named Wilbur Littlefield. And I know, didn't know at the time that Mr. Littlefield was the head public defender of Los Angeles County. And he set me on the couch in his office with this big picture window overlooking downtown L.A. And I'm sitting there, and he's walking around talking about what public defenders do and stuff. And I'm thinking, yeah, let's, let's hear the other shoe drop. Let's hear about the alcohol thing. I'm ready to answer any questions. And I'm just sitting there praying, right? And he's t after he finishes talking for about 20 minutes, he gives me this funny little look. And then he walks over to the couch where I'm sitting. And he extends his hand, and he tells me, Ron, I said, Ron, we'd be proud to have you join our office. Proud to have me join his office. Damn. What is that but a miracle? Didn't he know that just two years before I was stealing food out of my mother's refrigerator? Didn't somebody tell him I had just gotten threw up a couple of years before by this dope dealer? I was carrying out his trash. What is that but a miracle? Cocaine Anonymous takes broken up pieces of men and women and working through unselfish people, bringing the message of recovery with the pieces back together again. It's as if all of you showed up in the lobby of the Harbor Light Center on July the 14th of 1986 and you found a scared, frightened little piece of a man with his head hanging in shame. And as if you, it's as if you wrap your arms around me and literally love me back to life. Damn. Since I've been sober, I have had countless miracles take place in my life. The lady that came here with me had the, gave me the honor and privilege of marrying me four years ago. Just a couple of months before that, I was standing in the delivery room of a hospital with her, cutting the umbilical cord on my first child, Ronald Jr. <laughs> no ego, right? <laughs> That's a miracle. Prior to getting here, I was no more than that trick that you ladies love to see coming. The kind that, you know, I, I always thought I had to have a package to get a woman. And you get me in the motel room, just say, Ronald, let's just have one before we get started. <laughs> you knew. Because that one would set me off. We no sex jumping off. <laughs> That's the kind of guy I am prior to this fellowship. Last year, you remember how I used to water the lawn for that dope dealer? Well, last year, I believe it was in March of last year, I found myself standing on the lawn of the White House in Washington, D.C., being interviewed by these news reporters because I had been invited there by the president for this briefing on this federal crime bill they had. Somebody who knew of my work as a public defender 
felt that I could contribute something, my thoughts on what should go in there. They didn't know who they had up in there, huh? I'm the guy that would normally have been peeing on the lawn of the White House. <laughs> That's Cocaine Anonymous. I've actually had men and women trust me enough to share their innermost selves in fifth steps with me. And people who have been actually kind enough to sit down and listen to my innermost self when listening to my fifth step. That's the fellowship. If there's somebody new in here who thinks this thing is about having a nice pitch from the podium or wearing nice suits or having a lot of babies or doing anything like that, that's not what Cocaine Anonymous is about. Those are fringe benefits that come from sober living. But you see, this fellowship is about gaining access to the power, about gaining a relationship with a power that enables me to say, no, thank you, I'm not hitting today. That enables me to say, yes, I'm going to work today. That enables me to say, yes, I'm going to Utah. <laughs> I'm telling you, y'all, you just don't know. I get goosebumps. Just thinking about what you have given me. You have literally given me my life. I have, like a friend of mine shares, I have had the opportunity, the grace, the unmerited gift to live two lifestyles in one lifetime. That's a miracle. You know, I want to thank the committee again for allowing me to come out and share my life with you. To allow me to stand up in an upright position and let you know what God can do with just a little bit of material. And let you know that what he's done for me, he can do for anybody that's in this room. Again, for all of you here in Utah, I, I, I look forward to sharing this entire weekend with you. And I want to thank you for welcoming me and making me feel once again a part of God could and would if he were sought. Thank you for letting me share.